Hello. Um, thanks for having me today. Um, and special thanks to John, who made all the arrangements for me to be here. And um, thank you for coming out on such a gross day, because it's really <laughs> gross out. So, um, and I'm really looking forward to this because uh, you know, I'm at Queens and Queens and Queensboro have such strong connections. So I'm looking forward to um, our conversation after the talk. I think that, uh, I'm, or I'm hoping that this idea of who the public is at the public university is something I think that resonates across both campuses and throughout CUNY. So, um, okay, so as I mentioned, the title of my talk today is Who is the Public at the Public University? Creating a Mission Through Citizenship and Literacy, oh, sorry, Literacy and Citizenship. Um, and it builds from my book um, and presents some of my current research on the development of public missions at universities and colleges with a focus on how these um, public missions have impacted literacy and citizenship training that occurs in these spaces. Um, the talk itself is uh, divided up into three sections. Um, the first part, um, in the first part, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the broader questions about literacy and citizenship training in the United States and some of the history behind it, um, using a couple of examples from the early 20th century um, concerning work-oriented definitions of citizenship, and that's drawn from um, the book project that uh, John mentioned. Um, the second part addresses what uh, David O. historian David O. Levine calls the culture of aspiration. Um, that was established during this 1920s and 1930s era uh, and how this culture of aspiration set up broader questions, I'm sorry, broader, the broader expansion and democratization of higher education in the post-World War II era um, and specifically the publication of the federal document, Higher Education for American Democracy, um, also known as the Truman Report. So, and then, um, in part three, I will address some of the implications of this expansion for mass literacy teaching um, and the development of public missions at public institutions of higher education. Um, so I'm gonna start by sharing a small bit from the mission statement of my own um, home institution. And the very first line of this Queens College mission statement um, reads, the mission of Queens College is to prepare students to become leading citizens of an increasingly global society. Um, now, this kind of phrasing is um, nothing controversial or even um, innovative. Many schools um, in the United States invoke similar goals of um, global engagement and citizenship in their public documents. Although, um, I should note here uh, that uh, Queensboro, um, while using phrases like global awareness and engagement and success in these kinds of documents, I actually could not find explicit reference to citizen um, in your mission statement or any of the introductory material in your like course catalog or annual reports or faculty and student handbooks. Um, and the absence of that common phrasing I think is um, interesting, particularly when comparing um, or thinking about like Queens and Queensboro um, together in terms of goals, you know, we are a shared institution within CUNY, um, and we might talk about that during um, the Q and A. So, um, what I want to look at today is um, at the belief that higher education is about serving and producing citizens, because I think even though Queensboro um, doesn't have this in their mission statement, I think that this is a pretty, as I said, a pretty common goal. Um, for institutions. Um, and so I'm particularly interested in looking at the idea of um, this idea of citizens in an increasingly global society um, and how this came to be and um, denaturalize that relationship between education and citizenship. Um, and I'm also interested in why this is the case, why the enterprise of producing citizens and cultivating a certain kind of citizenship is unquestionably um, part of the goals of education and higher education um, more specifically. I'm arguing today that while this tight bind between citizenship training and higher education is nothing new, it is also the product of some very specific movements and trends within higher education that rely on assumptions about citizenship and literacy and about the work we do at the university. And I suggest that these kinds of citizenship invocations are useful for institutions because they are capacious. Whether you imagine that a responsible citizen in a global community is an ethical participant, a productive um, economic contributor, someone who has global cultural awareness, or a person who has the potential to just be a good employee in the economy, all of these definitions can fit into this phrasing. Um, but I believe that if we want to take citizenship and all of its rich definitions as a serious goal, um, rather than a vague understanding, then we must be more specific. 
Um, my own working of def my own working definition of citizenship um, reaches beyond the strict legal definitions of a specific status in a nation state to the notion of um, full citizenship, which embraces cultural citizenship, access to resources, um, ability to participate in democracy, um, and the access to um, practice full citizenship in everyday interactions or um, habits of citizenship. And this definition is based on um, some citizenship theory work by Awa Wong, Brian Turner, and Danielle Allen, among others. Um, I think where this notion of full citizenship and higher education um, intersect is how universities and colleges imagine themselves as producing citizens um, and what kinds of citizenship, especially um, when considering one, um, the varied ways that people are imagined to become citizens outside of the university setting, um, and two, how citizenship is being defined through the practices of the university, such as um, the literacy, critical thinking, and engagement skills that are being taught. Um, but before I talk more specifically about the higher education context um, and how the incorporation of citizenship production helps institutions fulfill a public mission, um, I wanna step back for a moment uh, to think about that first point, the varied ways people are imagined to become um, citizens outside of the university setting. So um, this is a co the cover of my book, um, which just came out like two weeks ago. Um, so uh, I look closely um, in this book at how literacy training at three different sites worked to produce particular, particular kinds of citizens in the early 20th century. And um, I was working with that time period for a number of reasons, mostly to do with the um, heightened anxiety around immigrants as demonstrated by the um, level of legislative activity around immigration and um, citizenship during this period. Um, additionally, oops, sorry. Um, additionally, uh, this time also saw the rise of a mass manufacturing economy um, in the United States, which historian um, Herbert Gutman describes as a mature industrial society in which industrialism um, eclipsed previous agrarian and um, craft-oriented economies. Uh, this economic shift marked a change in work that was not just about um, the work itself, but the cultural expectation that um, bosses were making decisions about who was qualified for particular jobs, um, or workers are, um, were judged and appraised for their work skills and their potential to be good workers through um, traits such as literacy. Um, I found that in a number of places, including federal Americanization programs, union education programs, and university English departments, that citizenship and literacy training were being used to respond to this set of legislative and economic conditions, and that, um, not surprisingly, um, the responses were quite different depending on what kind of worker the sponsoring institutions wanted to produce. Um, and I should note here that I'm working from um, this uh, literacy theorist, Deborah Brandt, and her idea of um, sponsors of literacy, and she defines literacy sponsorship as um, any agent, local or distant, concrete or abstract, who enable, support, teach, model, um, as well as recruit, regulate, suppress, or withhold literacy and gain advantage by it in some way. So um, the sponsoring institution isn't just um, providing literacy because they think individuals will benefit from it, but also because um, they're gonna benefit it benefit from it in some way. Um, so for example, uh, the United States published a series of textbooks uh, beginning in 1918 and through the 1920s uh, to help prospective immigrants learn English um, that reveal how literacy training was used to cultivate a certain kind of citizenship um, in new immigrants. These textbooks produced by the Bureau of Naturalization um, with help from the Department of Education are filled with lessons uh, such as um, this one from the 1922 version of uh, the Federal Handbook called Angelo's Promotion, in which the title character um, gets promoted with better pay because the foreman liked his work. So in this lesson, and it's too small probably for you to read, so I'll read a little bit of it. Um, in the lesson, Angelo reported to his wife that the foreman told him why he got a promotion. And um, so it says, this is the foreman's words, um, you keep at your work well, you follow my orders, um, you do your best, you obey the rules of the factory. You speak well of your bosses to other workmen and you, give direction, you can give directions well to the new help. Um, so Angelo was obedient and he followed the rules, but um, what was the ultimate sign for the foreman? You can see like at 
if you can see right at the bottom. Um, it says, I see you reading the bulletin board and Angelo tells his wife, I'm glad I went to evening school. Um, Angelo then says, humbly of course, that he just kept busy and did his best every day. And that's the last line of the, um, of the lesson. Um, so this lesson contained a number of essential traits for the productive worker citizen. Um, not only did Angelo work hard and follow orders, he also learned to read, um, which demonstrated his engagement and commitment to his job. Through this lesson, immigrants saw the rewards available from practicing habits of citizenship, such as learning how to read, following the rules, doing your best, um, and the reward is a promotion at work. Uh, this definition lies in stark contrast to the citizen hoped to be cultivated by union education programs. Um, invocations of the citizen in these texts and the promotion of citizenship production are less explicit than in the federal programs, which were charged um, specifically with guiding immigrants down the legal and cultural paths to citizenship. Um, union education programs that promoted habits of citizenship focused less on political practices such as voting um, or cultural markers such as economic productivity, um, and more on things like strategies, skills, um, and ways of thinking that would guide workers to fight for um, the recognition of their own contribution in an in industrial society. Um, organizers such as um, Fanny Cohn, who was the educational director of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, um, hoped to cultivate uh, intelligent workers and citizens of the community, as she noted in um, this column, Our Workers University. Um, she wanted um, to create workers who were on equal footing with their employers, both in the workplace and um, in the world, and imagined that they would then be able to help the labor movement gain ground toward a unified labor-oriented education that would teach um, general education, um, a general education curriculum, which included uh, English language skills, reading, writing, argumentation, but also things like um, labor history and economics. Um, and so if uh, laborers received this education, they were imagined to become more organized unionists as a result. Um, as in the federal documents discussed previously, um, literacy and proficiency in English was seen as a gateway to other habits of citizenship. Uh, intelligent citizenship was a common refrain in documents like um, the labor newspaper Justice, which carried a weekly column on educational news. Um, the phrase intelligent citizenship was shorthand for these different goals, and educational programs offered explicit training towards this, its cultivation. Proponents of workers' education like Cohn felt that union members would be better served um, if they were educated, the most talented of the rank and file could then become the future leaders of a now educated labor movement. Labor unions hoped that the widespread literacy training they offered would help them gain members and strengthen their organizations, and additionally, and more importantly, um, create a worker-oriented industrial citizenship that would encourage collectivity and thus a more equitable society. Um, so these questions about how citizenship and literacy work together and how forces such as economics, immigration, um, public policy, culture, and work come into play into sh um, with shaping literacy training and defining citizens, um, it, those things really characterize the work that I did in the first book project and informs this um, new research that I'm gonna be talking about um, on uh, public missions and universities. Um, so at this point in the early 20th century, there were a number of places where citizenship certification through literacy occurred, the kind of cultural certification that goes beyond the legal realm. But I'm interested in higher education and its role in, as part of the process of citizenship production too, particularly in light of the expansion of higher education over the course of the 20th century. Um, while education as a citizen producing space has deep roots, um, one could trace back to the Greeks, Thomas Jefferson, um, Horace Mann, or John Dewey to make this argument. Um, the more elite arena of higher education was not a significant part of this connection in the United States until the last 75 years, um, arguably since um, the post-World War II rise in um, college students <clears throat> um, during that time. So um, US higher education has long been characterized by this um, dueling tension um, as elite certifiers of advanced knowledge and then as an integral part of the social engine. Um, the mark of exclusivity associated with higher education has contributed to the belief that college was the key to unlocking inequality 
because a college education was seen as a resource that every, um, not everyone could access. So as a result, higher education has been operating on a mode of expansion through the 20th century and into the 21st, cultivating the idea that access alone can solve um, the social and economic inequity of the country. Higher education has been supposed to provide citizens with full access to societal resources by certifying them as college educated and prepared for certain kinds of employment. Um, and while this expansion doesn't eliminate um, other spaces similar to the ones that I've just discussed, like union education programs um, and Americanization programs, um, or even community spaces, the increasing um, cultural and economic importance of the college degree has become critically, um, a critically important credential in modern society. And I think it's important that we better understand the consequences of um, university-styled citizenship and literacy becoming more dominant over other forms, particularly in the space of publicly funded institutions that are supposed to have um, public responsibilities. Um, educational historians often trace the roots of public higher education to the Morrill Act of 1862, um, which outlined the responsibilities that came with the granting of public higher education. Um, in a history of American higher education, uh, John Thalen, um, an educational historian, describes that what has been quite influential is how the Morrill Act established a complex partnership between the government and institutions in which collegiate programs um, in such useful arts as agriculture, mo mechanics, mining, and military instruction were mandated. Um, and so this move from, um, toward making institutions serve a public good through vocational training establishes a foundational connection in public institutions of how the idea of the public is being interpreted. Um, Land-grant acts thus tied public education um, to public interest in some way, particularly characterized by um, the vocational training that it offered and, um, and economic training that it offered. Um, but land grants were not the only thing that motivated more interaction with the public and the development of public missions in higher education. The assumed importance of higher education in the social engine is a result of a number of policy decisions and discussions about higher education over the 20th century and into the 21st that allow contemporary dialogue about US higher education to naturalize its role in social advancement. From that first legislative action, which laid the foundation for a national system of state-sponsored colleges and universities, um, and I think it's noteworthy um, that state institutions uh, existed prior to this point, but the roles and obligations were not necessarily um, articulated in the same way where it was about like vocational training, and they just um, were public institutions. Um, so, um, so you had uh, the Morrill Act, you had the GI Bill, um, in 1944, um, the 1947 President's Commission on Higher Education, um, and the open admissions policies that permeated many public institutions, including CUNY um, in the late 1960s and 70s. And this picture is from um, City College. Uh, U.S. institutions of higher education, um, through all of these things, US, U.S. institutions of higher education have worked to incorporate um, and accommodate growing numbers of post-secondary students. And so, um, in particular, I point to what David O. Levine has called the cultural culture of aspiration that developed in higher education in the 1920s and 1930s, which made higher education more desirable and made possible the resulting post-World War II efforts to expand college. The small but significant surge in enrollment in the 1920s and 30s um, opened the door to higher education because it made access to the elite institution of higher education seem possible, if not probable. Um, Thalen reports a huge wave of um, campus building between 1920 and 1945 to accommodate new students, um, which increased from 250,000 to 1.3 million in between the two world wars. Um, and in terms of the U.S. population, Thalen says that, um, quote, whereas fewer than 5% of Americans between the ages of 18 and 20 attended colleges in 1917, over the next two de decades, that figure increased to 15%. Um, while this isn't the f overwhelming flood of students that is often uh, attributed to the post-war period of the late 1940s, this marked increase indicates a growing interest um, and imperative to attend college and the expansion of higher education, particularly at state-funded institution, 
Um, and this imperative was both social and economic, in particular um, for those who wanted increased access to entry-level white-collar jobs. So um, given this development, college became something that young people could aspire to, even if it was still a remote possibility. Um, and that aspiration yielded the growth of all institutions of higher education as a way to accommodate this increased interest, but also specialized, um, also the specialization of certain institutions um, and exclusivity um, at others. So you saw an increase in specialized institutions like teaching colleges, regional institutions, and liberal arts colleges. Um, and the growth in higher education institutions also created um, the unprecedented demand for higher education of any kind as a symbol of economic and social mobility, which enabled some colleges to select their students for the first time. Um, so you had uh, the regional colleges um, and these smaller institutions who were um, taking up certain kinds of students, and then you had other institutions, um, private institutions, the IVs, et cetera, um, who um, were then were suddenly able to be really, really, really exclusive um, with who they were taking in. And you can imagine how this selectivity um, was also based on um, cultural exclusivity um, in the face of growing ethnic populations in the United States. Uh, in talking about the culture of aspiration in the post-World War I era, Levine describes how institutions needed to be clear about the kind of student they were hoping to attract, and that in the following decades after World War I, each college and university was forced by social institutional pressures to reevaluate the curriculum it offered, the type of student it wished to attract, and its role in the na local or national community it wished to serve. Um, for public institutions, this meant a more fully articulated mission to serve the public, making themselves distinct from private institutions. Public institutions um, could not have flourished without this proliferation of colleges and universities in which each needed to distinguish itself and in which public and regional schools attended to this growing population of students. In particular, ethnic and poor students were often channeled into less acclaimed schools and less prestigious occupations that offered um, new courses and new hope to those who clamored for an opportunity to move up the economic and social ladder um, when they were kept out of many um, liberal, art, liberal arts and other selective institutions. These factors provided accessibility to the prestigious ranks of higher education without um, many of the attendant monetary costs while simultaneously offering both physical and cultural proximity to home. Um, Levine also contends that this expansion connected higher education to market needs and industry. Um, and he writes, uh, after World War I, institutions of higher learning were no longer content to educate. They now set out to train, accredit, impart and impart social status to their students, the curriculum became inextricably tied to the nation's economic structure, particularly its burgeoning white collar middle class sector. The culture of aspiration established a certain expectation for what higher education was supposed to provide, a kind of um, certification for more prestigious and white collar vocations, as well as a belief that higher education was a goal that all individuals could and should meet. Higher education was beginning to firmly establish itself as part of the US social engine, um, rather than um, just a training ground for elites, um, and as a way to help people attain a stronger economic standing. The growth of higher education and the increase in enrollments helped establish a hope around itself, one that firmed up the logic for future educationally based policy, like the GI Bill, in which higher education was a means to reward veterans and guarantee their passage from military to civilian life. Um, in 1946, Harry Truman consolidated this aspiration toward more concrete federal higher education policy in which the role of higher education in the social engine and as a key to the production of citizens. Higher Education for American Democracy, a report of the President's Commission on Higher Education published in 1947, um, charged educational leaders and the government to expand higher educational opportunities for all. The report solidified both um, connections between the expansion of higher education to democracy and the expansion of higher education as a solution for inequality. It was also the first um, significant national document to label the result of higher education as citizenship. And these intertwined goals uh, established a need for more higher education for everyone, for the good of the country, and for the good of the individual. Uh, 
Thalen, John Thalen describes how this post-World War II time, um, in this post-World War II time, the shape of American higher education was altered because its base was extended so as to move significantly closer to providing mass access to higher education while simultaneously increasing the selectivity, prestige, and reach of certain kinds of programs and institutions as illustrated by the increasing number of um, doctoral programs and junior colleges that happened also during this time. Um, during this period, he notes that uh, an 80% increase in enrollment with just under 1.5 million um, college students in 1939 to almost 2.7 million in 1949. Um, the publication of the Truman Report and a federal mandate connected to higher education, to democracy and citizenship, created space for questions about access to higher education and the role higher education played in creating citizens. In the letter of appointment published at the beginning of the volume, Truman writes about the importance of rethinking higher education in this moment because of the number of veterans who go to school upon their return. He wants to use this moment um, to expand educational opportunities and um, quote, it seems particularly important therefore that we should now re-examine our system of higher education in terms of its objectives, methods, and facilities and in light of the social role it has to play. Um, like the Morrill and other land grant acts, the Truman Report and the President's Commission on Higher Education made explicit connections between higher education and a public good mostly described in the Truman Report as um, the social role of education. Um, in a democratic society is at once to ensure equal liberty and equal opportunity to differing individuals and groups and to enable the citizen to understand, appraise, and redirect forces, men, and events as these tend to strengthen or weaken their liberties. The report articulated a number of foundational ideals and expectations about higher education in the United States that helped create vital connections between higher education and access and between being college educated and gaining citizenship. First, by codifying the culture of aspiration, they established higher education as a necessity for economic-based citizenship. They wrote, um, by allowing the opportunity for higher education to depend so largely on the individual's economic status, we are not only denying millions of young people the chance in life in which they, to which they are entitled, we are also depriving the nation a vast amount of potential leadership and potential social, and social competence which it sorely needs. Um, and so the idea here is that they recognize the importance of higher education to help individuals gain economic status but that access should not be determined by how much money you had in the first place. Um, okay. To that end, the Truman Commission created a federal mandate to expand higher education beyond the elite by calling upon institutions of higher education to embrace their broadened charge of creating citizens, not the elite. They put forth the call that um, American colleges and universities must envision a much larger role for higher education in national life. They can no longer consider themselves merely the instrument for producing the intellectual elite. They must become the means by which every citizen, youth, and adult is enabled and encouraged to carry his education, formal and informal, as far as his native capacities um, permit. <clears throat> Excuse me. And with this call, colleges and universities were asked to think about how to contribute to mass education at this level, positioning higher education as necessary for every citizen in order, as necessary for every citizen to fulfill, as they say, um, their native capacities. Um, so lastly, the commission not only obliged higher education to broaden its constituency, but made explicit connections to that work and the health of democracy and the production of citizens. They explained that the task um, President Truman assigned to this commission was to define the responsibilities of higher education in American democracy um, and in international affairs and to re-examine the objectives, methods, and facilities of higher education in light of the social role it has to play. And their descriptions of the social role encouraged institutions to consider the possibility of um, social and public missions connecting this encouragement um, to federal funding possibilities. Uh, the significance of the Truman Report is that it laid the groundwork on a federal level for much of the continuing beliefs about the need for expanding access to education and provided a codified rationale and government support to do so. It helped establish the belief that accessibility to college is crucial to help eradicate inequality in our society and help all individuals practice full citizenship. 
The imparting of social status and the role of preparedness in a broad sense, not just to certify the nation's elite, is an important step in the move toward the assumption that citizenship production was part of what public institutions were supposed to be doing. The reinforcement of ideals about the public mission happened on a federal level, connecting education to citizen making and helping increase social mobility. Um, and what was especially significant was the wide reach of the parties who were involved. Um, this was the first time uh, a president of the United States deliberately extended federal inquiry into um, nationwide educational in issues, um, higher education issues. Um, and according to um, historian John Thalen, with this extension, um, the Truman Commission report managed to assert forcefully a number of findings and recommendations that would be the blueprint for, a, um, for subsequent federal policies involving um, financial aid and the long-term expansion of post-secondary education. Um, so I've touched on the impact of the culture of aspiration and the Truman Report briefly, but I hope that I'm relaying how these moments focused on um, focused, relaying how these moments focused higher education on goals such as growth, um, accessibility, specialization of both institutions and areas of study, um, uh, vocationalism, and its role in the social engine. Altogether, these new associations with higher education laid foundational work for the integration of a public mission in higher education that makes the invocation of citizenship as a goal seem like a completely natural association. Um, so finally, I'd like to turn to how these beliefs in the expansion of higher education, um, in the development of a public mission and citizenship production within higher education are connected to um, practices in rhetoric and composition and more current concerns with literacy and citizenship making um, at universities and colleges. Uh, yet late in the 20th century and into the 21st, the institutional circumstances of the public institution have shifted. State and city funding has been slashed. Institutions must cope by raising tuition cut, and cutting corners to make up the difference. Given the decreasing presence of the quote unquote public as it has previously been defined at these places, an important question that emerges from these changes is where, or even um, if the public can be found at public institutions. Um, and let me uh, use a quick example from the field of rhetoric and composition um, for how this is the case. So um, uh, in the 2010 College English Editorial, Composition Studies Saves the World, Patricia Bazell reminds us that the field of rhetoric and composition has often been motivated by um, quote, writing teachers um, desire uh, to find more effective ways of teaching increasingly diverse student populations in our classrooms. Um, and while Bazell is being somewhat cheeky with the universality of her claim, and you can see she has the exclamation point at the end of the title, um, this idea of saving the world through literacy has animated much of the work done in the field of rhetoric and composition. Um, Saving the world is another way of saying, we hope that our classrooms matter to the students who are in them, that literacy teaching creates some kind of public good, and that writing classrooms have a role in supporting social mobility. This desire to save the world, or rather use literacy to help students save the world and their worlds, can be interpreted in multiple, perhaps endless ways, particularly if we consider how such a goal shapes pedagogical practices, whether implicitly or explicitly through curricular trends like process writing and community literacy movements. Um, as I've previously discussed, there's a pervasive discourse in education about producing engaged citizens for um, the US democracy, the belief that students um, gain equality and opportunity from education. The goal um, of this historical work is to build an understanding of public institutions and through that show how literacy learning at this level has been a trajectory from those traditions of thinking. And that while we um, as instructors might not see our obligation as saving the world, the act of literacy itself, um, or li sorry, literacy teaching itself still contributes to these processes. Because of this, one likely place where this desire to save the world can be located is at publicly funded institutions that may serve um, many regional student populations. Trends in public higher education, like open admissions, were born at public institutions as part of a desire to create access for a broader population of students, and policies like these have helped connect such institutions with efforts to fight inequality. 
Saving the world at a public institution has become synonymous with educating parts of the population that might not otherwise have access to higher education. For these types of institutions, such as our own, um, helping increase access and success in higher education is a way of serving the public. With an expansion of a student population comes a more diversely prepared student body. And at public institutions, those who teach and direct first year writing programs are positioned to see how this comes to bear. With first year writing serving as a kind of um, gateway class at many places, even in the decisions about who has to take it, not to mention with curricular decisions, the course itself can reflect how an institution imagines the public mission. The role of serving the public is reflected in its role of preparing writers for their college careers. So it's important to look at how the course might be serving those who are not traditionally prepared, such as um, so-called uh, basic writers and um, English language learners at public institutions. And I'll use what's happening um, with remediation at the college level through basic writing as an example. Uh, for those who don't know, basic writing is um, a kind of code word among writing teachers for developmental writing or preparatory writing instruction. Um, and that's a quick gloss, but basic writing was one of the hallmarks of um, the expansion of the field in the 1970s, which coincided with another expansion of higher education um, during this period because of open admissions and as a result of civil rights fights for greater access to higher education um, that increased the number of students who were attending college in the late 60s and, and 1970s. Um, basic writings were put into place as a way to address the lack of traditional preparation that many instructors saw in these newer populations of students. Um, the elimination um, or the subsequent elimination of remediation at four-year institutions in states like New York, Ohio, and California has been cited as a watershed event in basic writing. Um, in The Future of Basic Writing by George Adi and Rebecca Milanarzik, um, they describe how sweeping attacks against remediation throughout the 1990s, combined with the desire of colleges and universities to increase their prestige, all resulted in the elimination of remediation at a number of four-year institutions, long held a stronghold for basic writing, such as um, CUNY, but also the University of Cincinnati, the California State System, and the University of Minnesota. While basic writing as a course, a practice, and a pedagogical movement was born out of the expansion and democratization of education and literacy during the 1960s and 1970s, the location of remediation exclusively to community colleges has segregated not only the classes, but also the institutional support needed to expand and democratize education. In other words, higher, access to higher education is still um, available to all, but only if you pass through the gateway um, of community college first. And the systematic um, elimination of remediation and outsourcing um, of basic writing to community colleges and other open access institutions does not even mean basic writing has disappeared from um, all other spaces. Uh, basic writing is not just at certain kinds of certain institutions, but many kinds of institutions, as Kelly Ritter argues in her book Before Shaughnessy, um, Basic Writing at Yale and Harvard, 1920 to 1960. Um, Mark Macbeth likewise argues that even with the move of remediation to community colleges, quote, on our desks we will still find essays with uncritical thinking, unconventional writing styles, and unstandardized language usage. Removing a selected group of students from the mix of our student body does not remove the problem of student writing difficulties. Um, and this elimination of remediation um, has produced some profound contradictions in the rhetoric of education in the United States um, that has historically promoted access, merit, and social mobility um, in contrast to these trends of eliminating remediation, increasing tuition costs, and rising student debt. Those contradictions raise questions about the purpose of certain schools, particularly public institutions, if their interpretations of public missions start to look more like the training grounds for elites as they did a century ago. Um, and this is not to say that all public institutions um, should be open to everyone and there should be open admissions everywhere, um, necessarily, um, but that as faculty at these institutions, we should be thinking more explicitly about how the work we do contributes to the public mission at the classroom and curricular level, especially in the face of decreasing institutional support and programs that do this. The continued expansion of higher education makes having a college degree even more of an imperative and more essential um, a more essential part of becoming a productive citizen. This process is rooted not in crisis, but in a legacy of access and aspiration. 
While this legacy produces moments of crisis, like the influx of students in the post-war or post-civil rights eras, it's only because the enduring belief in access and democracy um, that these crisis moments were even possible. In other words, without the logic of access and democracy as a driving force, the rise in student populations would not have been a crisis, um, but rather an anomaly that was quickly eradicated. With intersecting mandates to save the world and create access to higher education, public institutions have been uniquely positioned to embody some of the prominent tensions over who in our society should be educated and how, and the role of higher education in it. Regardless of whether we consider ourselves basic writing teachers or literacy educators, those of us who teach at public institutions have an obligation to think about how we serve the public interest through our teaching and our scholarly work. That's it. Thank you. I think we have questions. Do you have time for? Uh, and Amy okay. said she would take a few questions if um, people had questions. Better talk about experience, different experience of Queens versus Queensboro. I don't know. Maybe we can talk about it later. But. <laughs> Right. We have people here with global learning and things, so I'm sure they have some ideas, but I was wondering what you think about the word community versus citizen. Because mm -hmm. I mentioned at our last department meeting that a lot of community colleges are getting rid of the word community oh, because hmm. they feel like it used to be like two or three a year did it, mm -hmm. about 15 a year getting rid of the word community because they feel like the word community is a stigma and that their branding is better. So what's the replacement? <laughs> it wants to like rest on its own merits and yeah, not have any kind of, huh? Uh huh. So in the t in the name of the college, they're dropping community and um, but and but then you're saying also in the mission statements they are no, kind of taking well, that away or right? Right. Uh huh. So, and actually, now you're jogging my memory. <laughs> Henry Ford College, mm. community college, is doing it because Dearborn has the largest Arab population. Right. They actually felt like people who are in the U.S. see, like, they, they also feel like there's something status mm -hmm. But then I think they also, at the same time, are adding things like culinary arts and nursing. So uh huh. They have a couple four year degrees that justify the change. So it's kind of like a lot of what you're talking about. Right. Right. Like, what's the meaning? Is it right. going to be like a liberal arts school or like a culinary arts school? Right, yeah, and there's that whole idea of, the, of community as being code word, right, for like what, people. right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's really, I actually hadn't, I mean, I noticed that, because I, I mean, I, you know, I have a couple of friends who teach at schools who have actually done that, now that you think about it, I didn't really think anything of it, right? You know, right, like, right, like <laughs> right, hmm. And there's no uh, movement afoot within CUNY to do that, I'm assuming, yet. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah, I think that, I mean, it, and I think that it does, um, as David was saying, like, have a, um, that connection to prestige, right, and wanting to sort of say, we're not just a junior college, we're like an actual college, right? Um, and so, but then how that, I mean, what, what's interesting to me is like how that kind of works with um, accessibility part of it, because it's, I mean, and CUNY is um, kind of a, um, complicated but interesting example of like wanting to increase prestige and um, gather the tuition dollars of every high school student in the city it seems like um, and sort of how it is trying to do that by creating things like Macaulay and that kind of thing but then also um, what it what kind of resources it allocates to different types of schools and and who is 
given the spotlight for what reasons and, and that kind of thing. Um, so, um, so yeah, I think that that's, I mean, the whole, the absence of junior, the absence of community, um, I think is really, it seems really interesting um, just in terms of that, that whole trajectory of wanting to be known. I mean, CUNY wants to be, you know, known as the, what, like, uh, whatever, public Harvard or something, so. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Hi. Um, in terms of how we teach, um, hmm, I'm, I have to admit that I'm not like a, a technology scholar, <laughs> um, so I don't I don't know too much about it. But I mean, you know, obviously this idea of the digital divide—it's not just an idea. I think that it it exists. Um, but are you like thinking about something specific in terms of? Citizenship production and how and who has access to certain kinds of technologies and that kind of thing, or basically Web 2.0 as in students being more active and less on the right, a bit more agency by posing more versus taking in and the possibility of collaborative practices and so on. I don't know, I'm wondering how that usually how you think that connects to citizenship. Well, I do think that there is. Um, kind of in terms of that idea of participatory writing and um, Web 2.0, as you're saying, I think that there's more of an opportunity for students to um, engage and create sort of literate communities, communities or literacy communities um, uh, within their classrooms and also to participate outside of it. I think that um, there are a lot of, I mean, I, since I'm not a, a scholar in this area, I sort of hesitate to make <laughs> um, a, a strong argument about it, but I do feel like that there are um, kind of interesting other things going on, like the um, all the net neutrality stuff that's happening um, and the, uh, the huge presence of, um, like corporations in creating things like educational software um, that we participate in, such as Blackboard, um, CUNY First, <laughs> and that kind of thing that, um, that I think is, that complicates that issue, right? That it's not just as um, simple as now students have access to and can create um, and can participate through um, their own writing, which is I think is a great, Thing, but um, but I think there are kind of other structures as well that that complicate that um, and make it maybe not as um, uh, idyllic as we want it to be. So I think as as instructors we need to be. I mean we're in that um, that system already, so we just kind of need to be aware of how um, we help our students um, and guide our students um, to participate in these, um, whether that's through our, the assignments or the way that um, technology can be uh, critiqued um, in classroom spaces. But again, I'm not like <laughs> a scholar in this at, at all. This is, I mean, that, that I'm speaking more from, I guess, my own um, experience as a uh, writing program administrator at Queens and the way that we try to think about technology in our classrooms. Um, Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, in, in that case, if it's Blackboard, would they be considered a sponsor in that, in that framework? That you spoke? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that you know, traditionally, this idea of literacy sponsors, I think that you would normally think of like, oh, my, um, you know, fourth grade teacher who really encouraged me to read <laughs> and, um, um, and or uh, a you know newspaper who that existed um, in my neighborhood that I was able to start writing for um, or even things like a website I mean in, in today's world right that you so those those kind of um, structures are seen as literacy sponsors but I think that you're right that something like blackboard um, does sponsor literacy it certainly sponsors um, literate activity in the sense that it helps uh, create virtual spaces for students to do writing, but um, 
but it does capture um, what Brant talks about in terms of literacy sponsors, which is it's not just what they're providing, but what they're getting in exchange. And I think for Blackboard, and I don't know, um, I can't remember what the company is <laughs> that owns Blackboard, but they obviously um, get something out of um, their literacy sponsorship, right, which is schools buying their software and making a lot of money from it. I'm just curious sort of in, in your role as writing director mm -hmm. for the students here and also the professors. Um, what do you see as sort of, like I don't want to have a discourse of deficiency. Uh-huh, right. You know, what do you see, like, I think the chair of Queens, the English chair, uh -huh. said that like 40 or 50 percent of the students, like, it's over 40 percent of the students at Queens took at least one class at Queensborough. Uh-huh. It's sort of like what you see the strengths are of CUNY students or in Right. But if there's a deficiency, you know, what's one thing oh. that you feel, whether it's, you know, coming from the, the <laughs> side or the technology side, right. students are sort of deficient because we do exist in these structures right. of resources right. and right. class sizes and it's funny. city high school. Yeah, I mean, and I don't mean to be, this is, I feel like my answer, my, the first thing that came into my head is actually more about an institutional deficiency rather than a, um, <laughs> a um, skill deficiency, which I think it's about um, which, uh, the ways that uh, the institutions talk to one another and that I think that students often get um, lost in that transfer process and I know pathways supposed to solve it all right but um, <laughs> but I think that there are you know I answer lots of questions from students who are, who are transferring from Queensboro and other um, CUNY schools who are getting bad information or information where they think that like certain things count for certain other things and I think that um, I don't really know why that information um, is withheld, right, or not withheld but not accessible, let's say that, um, to students. I think that um, part of what I always encourage students, um, transfer students who um, are in my classes or who um, come into my office is to find ways to be their own advocate and to like gather the information and sadly just because some person in advising tells you that like a certain thing counts like that is not always the case like find it in writing <laughs> um, because uh, a lot of times like you know at Queens our advising office they're really overtaxed and they have um, a lot of part-time student workers um, or part-time workers who are advising students who don't always know the latest and they give out wrong information and then um, you know you think you're going to graduate and you can't and so I think that it's it's institutional um, so and it's kind of funny because I, I actually taught um, the, a, a section of first year writing last semester and it was for mostly transfer students it was exclusively transfer students actually and we spent we ended up spending an entire class period trying to figure out like what the requirements were going to be for their writing classes and like what they had taken and because of pathways there are these two different systems now and if you started at this time then you were had these requirements and you started this time you had these requirements um, and who to talk to and how to find information and and that kind of thing and how to navigate your own CUNY First account and degree works and all the other junk like that just is not I don't think that that's available to um, students or it's available to them but not told that it's available to them so I just I think that that for me is kind of I mean that's not in any way related to my talk but I do think that it is um, or maybe it is in terms of the idea of accessibility and the ways that um, you know we can we can help students but I, I don't I mean I you know I I think that um, in every class I've taught, whether you're a transfer student or not transfer student, I think that there are strong students and um, students who are not as strong. And I honestly, I, I think that it's about, um, you know, being, like I said, being an advocate for yourself. And I think that that can go for um, your own presence in a classroom as well, like talking to the professor and being an advocate for yourself in the class and institutionally. But that, I feel like that's kind of a depressing answer, right? Like, <laughs> that, uh, I think some of it, even, I would appreciate you coming to edit some of it, you know, at least with the different departments, mm -hmm. like, make it more transparent, right. even though it doesn't solve institutional, it could at least, you know, mm -hmm. publicize a little more on a department by department basis with faculty and how 
right. From, sorry? A vocational training? Um, I think, I mean, most uh, educational theorists would say, and I think I agree with them, that there's actually um, movement toward more vocational training, um, both at two-year institutions and four-year institutions. So even something like a major in um, engineering uh, is seen as kind of a move toward vocational training as opposed, whereas, you know, 75 years ago, that student might have been encouraged to major in physics, which is like a more seen as a more um, typical like academic subject as opposed to something that's going to train you for um, for a job. But I do think that 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 tension between um, vocational and um, you know what people imagine as like this um, pure academic pursuit is. Um, is interesting, especially in light of uh, thinking about serving um, student populations who might want, a, you know, might think like, oh, I need to have a major that is that has a clear vocational path where I can um, have a certain kind of job after I graduate because I'm taking out student loans and doing all these other things. And I think that um, for me and maybe the um, the other English department faculty in the room, I think that that's a particularly interesting question because um, English is not a clear vocation, right? And But how does an English department show itself to have vocational value and whether a department, an English department wants to show itself to have vocational value or is it about the study of literature? I think those are interesting questions that a lot of English departments are kind of grappling with right now. It seems like there's been this, um, there was this sort of flowering or expansion of access in education uh -huh. after the war in the 1960s <coughs> and now there's been this contraction mm -hmm. with um, access being um, sort of shuttled off to two-year colleges. Mm -hmm. and, and private, um, like pro for-profit institutions as well, right? So exactly. Yeah. And even talk of, um, up at you know from politicians and administrators of ne needing to shuffle people through quickly, mm -hmm. get them through <laughs> four years, get um, lower standards, things like that. I'm wondering, what what do you think historically is happening? You know, I was at I got my master's at the University of Tennessee, and it was open access, mm -hmm. um, but we had to do certain things to sort of. Um, like we couldn't teach basic writing, so right. certain students had to be diagnosed on the first day and they went right. into the tutoring um, because it was the flagship. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what, what has changed, what has made us right. move to this? I mean, it's I mean, I do think that it's like, it's a, um, I mean, as I mentioned in the talk, I think some of it is a prestige race a little bit and trying to capture um, tuition payers um, at certain kinds of institutions. And I don't know, I mean, if if you all can answer this for me, which is do you feel um, as a two-year institution, you have more pressure put upon you to um, not accept, but to have more and more students? Um, because I mean, you know, at Queens, we're dealing with lower enrollments um, and, um, and that being an issue, right, which is that we don't have enough students and where are we gonna get more students? And I don't know if Queensboro is increasing or decreasing and, yeah. Um, I think then we had to uh, turn students away a couple two, years ago. Two years ago we turned students away. We actually were in open access, it was a cutoff date. Uh -huh. And then we dipped a little and now we're pretty much, one of the reasons it's hard to get people to go to things is we used to not schedule classes during club hours. Mm -hmm. Like you have to have a class during this time or it wouldn't work. Right. So I think my, you know, my um, suspicion would be that Queensboro would that exactly that that Queensboro would have like more and more numbers. But then, as like CUNY hasn't quite figured out um, 
like how to uh, like they've figured out how to keep people out of certain institutions, but then not how to draw people to the like a place like Queens. Um, maybe I shouldn't be revealing this, but I feel like a lot of the discussions um, among administrators is about you know, how we're gonna recruit certain kinds of like high school students, how can we get them to wanna to come here and, um, and that kind of thing. And I think that, um, so it's like, okay, we don't wanna offer things like remediation or basic writing and we want to keep certain students out, but then the idea of like bringing students in hasn't exactly been explored <laughs> to, I mean, at the campus level, yes, like within Queens College, it gets talked about a lot, but in terms of CUNY as a body, I feel like that there's not necessarily, it doesn't seem like there's a, a big grand vision for how that is gonna be accomplished, right? Other than um, cutoffs and exclusivity, like how there are other ways to, um, I think, make your institution more prestigious, but it doesn't seem like there are specific movements toward doing that really, other than Macaulay. So um, in my opinion, I should say, I'm not. <laughs> So, yeah. I don't know if this is a stupid question or not, but do you ever, I guess in teaching courses, I guess if it relates to citizenship and writing, do you ever come across students that question their citizenship and whether or not they should follow the course of mm -hmm. going through, you know, I guess you probably brought it up before as far as with society, society says that they have to do this or that in order to make it in this life or, right. or you know, like, I guess basically just, just go through what it takes to get your degree and mm -hmm. just not worry about questioning like government rules and what it means to be a citizen. You just basically just go through, I guess, just the program, just get your degree and just, you know, once you graduate, you right. become a citizen. Well, the, I mean, that question is actually a lot of what um, has motivated my own research because I'm really interested in kind of the um, the tension between those two things, which is the um, I think that uh, the institutions like in mission statements and that kind of thing always talk about how we want to create citizens, and there is I think. Um, some implicit association within that about this idea of questioning and participation and that kind of thing. But then in terms of curriculum, the definition of citizenship seems very much based on kind of going through getting your job and, and doing all those other things. And I think that um, what happens in the classroom can kind of um, be both of those things. And I think that one of the things that, that interests me in this line of research is trying to figure that out and also within, um, you know, at, at many institutions, not everyone is um, a legal citizen of the United States, nor do they want to be. And so what does it mean when um, this idea of citizenship is brought up over and over and over again when you have students in your classroom who might not be legal or might be citizens of other countries who, and, and they, like I said, don't have any interest in becoming US citizens and this idea of US, US and American style citizenship is so much a part of the US educational system, of course, but, um, but why, you know, how does that kind of shake out um, in terms of how we run our classrooms? So how do you as a, I guess a teacher or professor, mm -hmm. If a student questions, do you basically, you know, do you offer your own opinion or you just go according to, you know, um, just let the student right. basically have their own? Well, I, I actually hope that a student is questioning, right, of, um, of these ideas uh, and the idea of what, you know, what it means to be a citizen um, is something that I think is uh, is an interesting question to explore with a class. I don't I don't expect the institution itself doesn't have a set definition of what that means, and I don't expect my students to. Although I think it's um, I've had very interesting conversations with them about um, what it is they you know, what they imagine as citizenship and what they hope citizenship is. So I think that that kind of questioning, for me, I think it's fruitful when it becomes part of the, the discussion. So I, I don't 
shy away from it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for coming.